Welcome to the third part of this virtual geology field trip around Flamborough Head. This part of the tour will visit sites at the eastern end of the headland at Selex Bay and High Stacks. All beach localities must be visited only after consulting a local tide timetable and ideally on a falling tide. In the first part of the tour, we examine sections in the cliffs at Speeton and Bempton, the highest on the headland. And in part two, we moved eastwards to examine beach sections at Thornick Bay and North Landing. Together, these localities provided us with windows into the stratigraphy of the Lower Cretaceous Hunstanton Formation and the Upper Cretaceous Chalk Group, from its base up to the High Turonian of the Burnham Formation. We also noted the increasing thickness and lower base level of the Pleistocene deposits as we approached the eastern part of Flamborough Head, and also evidence of pre-Devensian Paleo Valleys. In this part, we'll be looking at neighbouring sites at the very end of Flamborough Head, shore sections at Selex Bay, and after a short cliff top walk, an overview of high stacks. Our itinerary includes access to the shore in Selex Bay, followed by exploration of the wave cut platform for signs of structural deformation of the chalk between the foot of the steps and Crystal Cave, a wave cut notch. From there, we'll move into Monk Hole and take a look at the lithostratigraphy in a relatively undisturbed section before crossing to the north side, noticing more structural and some new sedimentary features in Mulk Hole and on Kindle Scar. The steps leading down the cliff from the lighthouse provide opportunities to stop and appreciate many features associated with the results of marine erosion. There's a wave cut notch or small cave, the wave cut platform, and a stack. This stack on the southern side of the inlet is known locally as Adam. When describing Selex Bay in 1896, George Lamplew recorded a corresponding stack called Eve on the northern side, but it has since been completely eroded. From this viewpoint, we can also remind ourselves of the thicker deposits of till here at the lower eastern end of the headland when compared with Bempton Cliffs, which we visited in part one. Also notice the different profiles of the chalk cliff, which is almost vertical, and the overlying till slopes that often show the result of rotational slips leaving a concave shape. This is also a good time and place to assess the state of the tide and don hard hats ready for our examination of the section's access from the beach. As we approach the last set of steps down to the beach level, we pass on our left a section of the chalk cliff, which at first appears to expose chalk beds that are more or less horizontal. But on reaching the foot of the steps and looking back, we can see that the beds have been reshaped into a sharp anticline. Further evidence of chalk deformation is found to the south of the steps, where beds are steeply dipping to the north, and in places they're, they're close to vertical. To complicate matters even more, the tops of the steeply dipping beds are truncated by a sub-horizontal fault. Note also the set of old steps that remain following a landslip in the till deposits above that destroyed the higher section. They serve to remind us of the power of the sea and the dynamic nature of the coastline. When the state of the tide is favourable, it's possible to find the strike and dip of the chalk beds in the individual ledges formed by the bedding planes on the wave cut platform. 
In this small area, it's possible to recognize a syncline, which appears to be plunging to the left or the west. There's also abundant evidence of tensional deformation. Veins of calcite become increasingly frequent as we move south. And further south, we move towards the centre of a fault zone. And then brecciated chalk, cemented by calcite, appears. The walls and ceiling of a wave-cut notch, my crystal cave, contain masses of crystalline calcite and probably represent the centre of the crush zone, that is, the Selux Bay Fault. This, like the zone of deformation at Staple Nook, visited in part one, is part of the Flamborough Head Howardian Hills Fault Complex, reactivated by movement on the northern side of the Market Wheaton structure. It's further complicated by its proximity to the offshore peak trough fault system. The black arrows on the map indicate dip direction. We accessed the shore via the new steps, and then we worked our way past the steeply dipping beds at the old steps to Crystal Cave. Further south is Monk Hole, a cove, possibly a collapsed and subsequently enlarged blowhole site in relatively undisturbed chalk beds. The walls of the cove allow us to examine the lithostratigraphy of Salix Bay. The litholog shows that there are three lines of flint in the basal three metres of the section at the opening into Monk Hole. The flint varies from tubular or burrow form flints to lenticular and semi-tabular forms. A review of our stratigraphy of the Northern Province Chalk Group shows us that the Flamborough Chalk is flint free, so that the base of the cliffs here is in the Burnham Formation. The junction with the overlying Flamborough Formation occurs higher in the cliff, on this southern side end of Selex Bay and a similar Burnham formation sequence is also seen in Adam. Before we leave Monk Hole, let's spend a little time looking at the material that floors it. There's a great variety of rock type, ranging from locally derived chalk and flint to more exotic glacial erratics including granites, cyanite, dolerite, carboniferous limestones, and middle Jurassic plant-bearing sandstone. Much of this material results from erosion of the glacial till deposits and subsequent sorting by the sea. On a falling tide, we're crossing the wave cup platform, which may still be very slippery, and the Selex Bay Shatter Zone to the northern side of the inlet on our way to examine sedimentary structures and small faults in Mulk Hole, and then the lithostratigraphy on Kindle Scar. On the northern wall of Selex Bay, and on our way to Mulk Hole, we can see the complexity of the deformation here. There are thrusts, lystric faults, and possible overfalls. For further detailed information on the deformation on Flamborough Head, you're advised to refer to the excellent series of papers by Ian Starmer, published in the Proceedings of the Yorkshire Geological Society, and to the Geologists Association Guide, Geology of the Yorkshire Coast. The chalk in this cliff face often appears to be striped vertically, but on closer inspection, the stripes can be identified as veins of calcite. At the entrance to Mulk Hole, the beds of chalk appear to sag and some beds channel into beds below. These are interpreted 
as sedimentary features produced by unconsolidated sediment, possibly involving some mass movement, rather than tectonic deformation. They serve to remind us of the proximity of the Flambra area to the deeper Lake Cretaceous seas of the Cleveland Basin. Inside Malk Hole, possibly the site of another collapsed blowhole, we can see the chalk beds dipping gently to the south. And if we take the place of the figure on the right and follow his line of sight, we can view a magnificent sea arch through which we can just glimpse the platform of Kindle Scar. On our way out of Mulk Hole, it's worth studying the western, that's the right hand, wall of the entrance, where there's a series of small faults, indicated here by yellow broken lines, that are associated with calcite and mark the northern fringe of the Selex Bay deformation zone. The displacement on each fault is only a few centimetres, but it's picked out by two lines of lenticular flint. The sea has clearly taken advantage of these weaknesses to work back along the fault planes and begin the process of cave development. On Kindle Scar, the lower part of the cliff contains the highest flints of the Burnham Chalk Formation, known as the High Stacks Flint, and so marks the boundary with the overlying Flambra Formation. Looking back from Kindle Scar to the steps from which we access the shore, we can see again the different profiles presented by the chalk cliffs and the overlying glacial deposits. Resorting to those magical powers given to the leaders of virtual field trips, we can all levitate to gain an overview of Selex Bay. The yellow broken lines pick out the strike of chalk beds and indicate clearly the syncline that provides evidence for north-south compression. This appears to contradict the earlier evidence for tension provided by calcite veining. So it's clear that there have been at least two phases of deformation. Leaving Salix Bay by the steps and path back to the lighthouse and continuing towards the Coast Guard station, we can stop briefly above Pigeon Hole, being careful not to get too close to the unstable edge. The glacial till that caps the chalk is susceptible to rotational slippage, especially after wet weather, but from the cliff top we can make out the remains of a blowhole this time with its tunnel to the sea intact. This view provides a different angle and shows the tunnel exit at the bottom of the blowhole shaft, the concave plane of a landslip and an unstable block which is in the process of collapsing. From Pigeon Hole, we can continue along the coastal cliff top path to the easternmost point of Flambra Head, High Stacks. This is the final locality in this third part of our virtual field trip. In the first leg of our tour at Stapel Nook on Bempton Cliffs, we saw an elephant. Here at High Stacks, we have a young one. Its trunk and its eye and there's also a clear view of stages in the development of a sea arch with a more advanced stage to the rear of the elephant. The till deposits are relatively thick at high stacks and we begin to see some of their complexity. A lens of bedded chalk gravel is visible within the till. The sea is attacking the headland from more than one direction and threatens to break through and isolate high stacks from the mainland as a point which may well be 
another Paleo Valley. Recently, access to beach level at high stacks has become extremely hazardous and should not be attempted. But flint occurs in the lowest chalk beds exposed in the walls of the small cove. This is the high stacks flint, which we observed on Kindle Scar, and it marks the boundary between the flinty Burnham formation and the flintless Flambra formation. It is the last flint that we'll encounter on our tour of Flambra Head. In this part of our field trip around Flambra Head, we focus on the structural geology of the headland, the boundary between the Burnham and Flambra chalk formations, and the landscape features associated with marine erosion. In the fourth and final part, we'll be on the more sheltered southern side of the headland, overlooking Bridlington Bay. There are three good access points at South Landing, Danes Dyke and Sewerby Steps. We'll examine the stratigraphy of the Flambra Chalk Formation, including its famous Flambra Sponge Bed. We'll recognise further evidence of deformation and we'll encounter the complexities of the Pleistocene deposits and end at Lamplew's Buried Cliff where Flambra Head ends and Holderness begins. Once again, thank you for watching.